Hello, collective listeners. On today's episode of the Samson Train Coach Collective, we have one of my old mentors, Greg Adamson. Uh, he's currently the Associate Director uh, for Sports Performance at University of Tennessee. Uh, I thought he'd be really good to bring on because of his energy. And you guys will see immediately, he starts it right off with his signature, boom. Uh, and then he keeps rolling from there. And I, I think he gave me really good insight into what his philosophy is and and what he likes to do with his athletes, but then also how to continue to grow as a strength coach and, and how to audit yourself so that you can understand if you are making the necessary changes for you to still be successful in the field and also feel fulfilled, be the father and the, and the uh, husband like Greg talks about within the episode. So I thought it was a really fantastic episode. I hope you all enjoy. What's going on, collective listeners? On today's episode of the Samson Strength Coach Collective, we have one of my mentors, the amazing Greg Adamson, coming on. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Boom. Really appreciate Boom. you having me on here, Coach. How's your day going? At- and my day is fantastic. And now, and now that I've, I've heard of Greg Adamson, boom, to start my day, uh, it's even better. That's an immediate juiced up right there. It's a work day, baby. It's a work day. Every day is a work day for Greg. So, well, Greg, can you kind of just take us through uh, your career in strength and conditioning so far? Um, and then what brought you to Tennessee? Yeah, no doubt, Coach. Um, so, my first GA was 2008 at Central Michigan, Fire Up Chips. Uh, before that, I had interned at Winthrop University, where I went to school from 2004 to 2008. So I end up in Mount Pleasant, Michigan as a GA. I'm up there two weeks, and all of a sudden, I've got like five teams, right? And so fell in love with it. Like all of us, I enjoyed training in college and um, enjoyed the aspect. Exercise science was a major. I switched in. I was going to be a PE teacher. I didn't know that exercise science existed back in the day. Um, so I think that that was pretty exciting for me. So GA for two years, came back to the Carolinas. I was my highest paying job for a long time. I was a fitness consultant for a personal training studio uh, franchise group there in Charlotte where my wife was finishing up her uh, dietetic uh, clinical rotations. And I was still helping out at Winthrop, keeping myself there. And I had an opportunity to get the assistant strength coach job there. Paid 31000 Shout out to uh, Winthrop University. Go Eagles. There we um, go. So I took that job, took a large pay cut, and never looked back. I was there for a couple of years. Uh, had an opportunity in 2013 to come work with uh, football at the University of Tennessee with uh, one of my mentors, Dave Lawson. And it was interesting, right? So I'm at Winthrop, having the time of my life. Uh, everybody's having success because obviously I'm the best strength coach on the planet. No, in all seriousness, right? We had unbelievable <laughs> athletes and we had a good – administration a good thing going and i was having a lot of fun i rode my bike to work uh great balance and you know my former mentor calls me up and you know i congratulated him on the tennessee job and he said do you want to go and i was like give me 24 hours he didn't appreciate me asking for 24 hours uh i go and meet with the winthrop ad see what i can do maybe get some more money we've all been there and uh he just sits me down and politely is this good old country boy says greg Knoxville is a fantastic place to live. <laughs> so, uh, you know, no more money. Yeah, no, no money was coming my way. Uh, oh, yeah. Shout out to the basketball coach. They try to give me 5K. But, uh, you know, so I end up at Tennessee, show up the first day. I had a tie on trying to find a place and they yelled at me to get changed. And we just immediately started coaching. Right. Um, four months in, I had an opportunity to take over women's soccer and the coach that was the head coach at the time, knew a couple different people. You know, I'd worked with women's soccer at Central Michigan and Winthrop in men's soccer as well. And so it was a great opportunity. I was kind of maybe the last of a dying breed, still doing football, working Olympic sport, Friday night soccer, Saturday football game day. It was a lot to balance. Um, in that time, sports science, do 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 the famous thing that's out <laughs> the there. Hot topic. The hot topic, right? Uh, you know, so I was the young guy on staff. I was decent with technology, so I guess I was overseeing – we implemented heart rate monitors, catapult, all those things. Um, you know, so I oversaw that with football as well as implemented with women's soccer, you know. And so it was one of those things, man, the next couple of years were, I would say, a tough time for me personally. I was working too much. Uh, wasn't the father I wanted to be at times. Definitely not the husband I needed to be. Um, you, you know, I just, we, we talk about, I don't think balance ever happens, but I think just finding rhythm, right? And so I didn't have a good rhythm. Was doing women's soccer, was had my office in the Olympic weight room, also still was going down the football weight room. I was all over. Um, so a couple of years later, I went off the floor of football, 
picked up rowing. Another year later, I added a uh, swim and dives. So now I had three Olympic and made the transition from football to the Olympic sports. Um, then a couple years later, right, if you guys are still tracking, it's about 2017. We created a director of Olympic, which was long overdue. We hired a mentor of mine and a mentor of Connors and probably, you know, I think maybe the best performance coach in the country, Coach mm -hmm. Beast, um, you know, and he came in and obviously we never really looked back. Uh, gave him rowing, obviously. I said, hey, welcome to the team. I'm not doing three teams anymore. <laughs> uh, no, in all seriousness, um, you know, and I think that I've been there ever since, right? So it's my 11th season in the SEC at the University of Tennessee. Uh, I don't get it confused. I understand I'm a ball for now. I understand how this business works, but um, I've been very fortunate to raise my family. He, my son actually turned 10 today, and right, his whole life he's lived here in Knoxville. So I don't take for granted um, – the opportunity I've had to, you know, maybe get to experience some things that some coaches don't, which is uh, being in the community, right? Having a church I go mm -hmm. to, having different friends. Uh, I serve in the Air National Guard. I'm on my sixth year there, right? So the local base. And so, you know, I have these different people I know outside of strength and conditioning, outside of athletics. Um, so I, I understand that that's something to not take for granted in a business that sometimes can go the other way. Wow. And first of all, I want to say I really appreciate you for being real with everything, you know, um, and I think that's always the goal of this podcast is to kind of get down to the things that a lot of strength coaches kind of shy away from. And I think the, you know, one of the biggest things I looked at is you talking about not being the husband, not being the father that you wanted to be, and then making changes in your career to actually make that happen, uh, to transition into the father and the husband that you wanted to be. What, what was that period like? You know, what were, you know, balancing all of that? Yeah, so, I mean, everybody always says, what's your biggest mistake in coaching? You know, and I don't have to think very hard. Um, <laughs> my son was born, you know, 10 years ago today, so September 13th. We played Oregon that weekend and we got beat at Oregon. I'm working with football at the time for context. It's 2013. Uh, we come back home. We were in the hospital five ish, six ish days, a little bit longer. He uh, was underweight full term. It was a horrible birth. You know, they, it was emergency C-section and uh, it was just I, I looking at it now. I understand it. But when it's your first, you really don't grasp what a normal birth is to not. So, you know, we, he was in and out of the NICU a little bit. And uh, so we finally come home from the hospital. And my wife is obviously struggling, you know, um, and I go on the road trip that next week to Florida. Right. So I've been home. We've been home from the hospital two days. And so it's seven days, you know, and we go down there and the first half, our quarterback loved the guy to death, but he had more turnovers than completions. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the swamp is obviously, you know, obviously a, pretty cool place to play, but not when you're getting beat and you're at the University of Tennessee, not as cool then, right? So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I remember flying back and it hit me how hard that was, you know, and I was feeling the pressure of, you know, are we going to make a bowl game? You know, are we doing what we need to be doing in the off season? How, you know, what's it going to be like as we go out and try and recruit and rebuild a program? And I wasn't thinking about how is Sarah, my wife doing? How can I be there for Caleb? What does this look like? You know, and so I think that that's one of those things that uh, hit me a little bit later. Right. And the cool part about coaching is every year, every season, we get to redo it. Right. Like that's the the scary, the scary truth that we don't always discuss is we get a redo. Right. The athletes careers, they end, man, we get to restart it. Right. So we get an opportunity to make it right. And so when my daughter was born in 2016, man, I took a week off. Uh, and, and that was still probably too short, right? If I were to have a third kid, which I'm not going to uh, let the world know, right? I'm done. Uh, my house is like Noah's Ark for all you coaches out there. We got two dogs, two cats, two kids, two reptiles, so twos. Um, I didn't even know about the reptiles. <laughs> yeah, man, you know the kids run the house. Um, oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, man, so that's kind of, you know, I think that's one of those things I think I would encourage young coaches listening or middle-aged or older coaches, right? It really don't matter what your age is, but every year take an audit of where you're at outside of the profession. Um, because if you're trying to have sustainability, your athletes are gonna want you at your best and you're really at your best when you're, like I said, in rhythm. I think mm -hmm. balance once again is a myth because it's just, we all know there's times and there's weeks where when you're in this job, you're gonna be on. The problem is, is when there's times that you don't need to guard the desk, you don't get a trophy for being the best desk guarder in the world. And so I think it's just 
looking at it. And Dan was really good about that too, right? Like you, you obviously had him on the podcast and to all the listeners go listen to his with uh, Coach Connor here. It's obviously a great listen. But I mean, I think Dan brought a lot of that understanding of what it looks like as well. Um, and I think that people respect that, right? I think when you set those things in motion, people want to follow that as opposed to the chaoticness that isn't there. Absolutely. You know, it's so interesting that you talk about that because just this week I was talking with our director here um, and he was like, how have your lifts been going? And, you know, basketball, September or August, September timeframe is always going to be the busiest month. You're working with conditioning sessions, lifts, trying to get as much possible out of the offseason training before we start official practices. And, you know, the lifts aren't exactly where I wanted to be at. And I remember we talked about it and he was like, well, how was your mood going into the lift? And I was like, probably not the best. You know, and he goes, so if you had a bunch of bad lifts in the row, how, how many do you think is probably on you for setting the tone of the lift of the day? And I was like, you know what? That's a that's a great check right there because it's 100 percent the truth. And just to what you just spoke about as well. Are you doing what it takes to be the best husband, the best father, the best person in your life that then translates to being a better coach because you have taken care of yourself outside of here? So I think that's it's so true. And then on top of that, too, like. I love your family and, and seeing how they all operate and, and seeing, you know, I, I almost feel a lot of reflections of myself and you because of, uh, uh, I mean, my fiance is a dietitian. Your wife is a dietitian. Uh, you got me my first job at Texas Tech because they wanted you. And then you said, hey, I'm, uh, I'm not going to be available. But if you just want a younger me, you can take Connor. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's refreshing to have this conversation and get so deep into it already because, you know, I think I love to hear it. And I know our listeners love to hear it as well. Yeah, man. Shout out to our dietitian wives. Let's go. Dietitian wives. And your time. fiance. Fiance, yeah. absolutely. It changed a little bit the, yeah. for the podcast uh, listeners. They probably don't know. I, yeah. I got, uh, got engaged uh, just two weeks ago. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to future Mrs. Agnew as long as you don't screw it up. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. You know, and, and people always ask, they're like, is, you know, were you nervous? And I was like, I feel like the yes is pretty secure because she, she wouldn't be able to last more than six months with me if she wasn't going to marry me because I'm, uh, I can be pretty unbearable sometimes. So, <laughs> and we met at University of Tennessee. It worked out perfectly. Yeah, man. Shout out to yep. the nutrition bar. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, so, you know, for listeners, I'm sure they could catch up on your history and they could kind of understand that you've been a lot of places, you've worked with a lot of different sports, but, you know, for you to transition and be, okay, football, then to soccer, then to now a swim specialist and a golf specialist, what does that transition look like for you? Uh, how's that process been? And how has your philosophy kind of changed with each group or has it really stayed the same? No, I mean, I think that your philosophy in this role is to support the head coach, right? Um, and so it's their program. And so for me, it's always, you know, how can I bring value, right? Like, where do you feel like we can improve? And I think the tough part is um, we live in a society that obviously we have all this data and I love to use data, right? And we love the analytics, but we also want to know that we're feeling that value, right? And what I mean by that is, um, like, do they feel that you bring that edge, right? So like when I go work with golf, you know, my coach with, you know, I work with Brennan and Coach Webb and it's just, hey man, like where, where do you need me this year and where can I help us be better? And it may involve, right? Like, hey, it could get granular. Look, this athlete's internal rotation of the left hip isn't where it needs to be, right? The PGA average is this, we need to get here with that. It could be, hey, you know, our guys, don't necessarily know what it looks like to have consistent habits when they're away from here, right? So how do we put that into perspective? It could be education, right? Like they're not really grasping the why. Shout out to chat GPT, um, that'll help you explain it. <laughs> um, you know, and so I think that that's, uh, I think that that's something that it also evolves the longer you're worth a coach, right? So, I mean, my first year, now I'm gonna go swim, right? I'm on my eighth year with it and I love the staff, love coach credits, right? We're Year one, man, I was drinking through a fire hydrant. We brought in Vern Gambetta. He was getting paid to help me run the program, right? So there's some coaches out there that say, no, you're in the SEC. How could you let somebody else tell you what to do? And I say, hey, first off, the dude's like 70 and still moves around like a really good athlete. You know, him and shout out to him and Jimmy Ratcliffe at Oregon, good uh, mentors of mine as well. And, um, you know, but it's, it was a great opportunity to me to learn from Vern. Like, hey, how do you do it, man? What are, what are you talking about? You know, you've been working with these aqua creatures for a long time. And then I reached out to Keenan Robinson, USA uh, 
swim high performance director brought him out to Knoxville multiple occasions, the same thing, right? And so I'm learning from them. What are they doing? And those two guys couldn't be more on the opposite end of the spectrum. And so I always look at it. This guy's the best in the country at preparing high school down. In my opinion, this guy's the best with gold medalists up, right? So my job is to take the athlete from high school to gold medal, right? So that's what you got to really do from a needs analysis standpoint. And, and then you kind of move on from there, right? And so I'm in my eighth year, my conversation, I'm, I'm talking to Coach Credits. We're talking about, hey, what do you need from me this year? Where do you want me, man? It didn't. He sat me down and it didn't even involve anything necessarily in the weight room. And part of that's because he knows our culture is there and those kids are going to get to work. And it's, you know, I owe a huge thank you to you and so many of these young coaches that have helped out with swim and dive throughout the years. And more importantly, the athletes, right? They've set the tone and the culture in place. They teach. Um, but now it's like, hey, how do we do some other things, right? So I'm helping the team with communication. We're doing some different training on that type. And then it's a great opportunity for me to work with like Art of Coaching and Brett Bartholomew and his group and bring them in and start to really develop a plan on how do you periodize communication within a team, especially a large team that's got, you know, multiple Olympians, eight plus Olympians from seven different countries. You've got 60 kids with 27 of them being international, right? So how do we communicate and function as a team when the sport is really individual if we get down to it, right? So that's where the growth occurs, right? So I think one thing I want to encourage young coaches listening is you don't have to do it all in one year, right? Like my first year was how do I get the programming down? My second year was how do I get the teaching from the upperclassmen to the underclassmen down? Third year is how do I make sure the coaches are bought in? Fourth year is, all right, these are the first freshmen I've coached all the way through their senior year. Are we winning, right? Like if we're not winning at that point, I need to probably – get rid of myself. Right. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> we were winning shout out to our first SEC championship, but, uh, oh, yeah. you know, like so many, yeah, but you know what I mean? So I think that that's right. Like that's the, that's the thing is, you know, we talk about periodization so much in the weight room with sets and reps, but very rarely do we get into practice planning or planning out how do we want to look, make it look like. And part of it is, is, you know, we live in a society that it's hard to think long-term because of all the short-term movement. Right. And I get that. Um, you got to balance short-term versus long-term, you know, at the same time too, you can't make it too complex. Right. I've gotten simpler as the years go, go on because the simpler aspect allows me to make the complex changes. Right. And I think that's another thing I want to encourage young coaches is, is, you know, it's, it's easy to try and do it all, but you're going to be a, you know, you're going to, you're not going to be a master of anything. Right. And mm -hmm. so find some certain things that you can kind of really hang your hat on and the athletes can hang their hat on. Right. And they know that they got better. So uh, hopefully that kind of helps answer that question. I mean, dude, I've worked with 22 sports. I'm the ultimate learner. I mean, I'm a the only thing I'm really athletic at is spike ball and Mario tennis <laughs> on N64. Right. Like I hang my hat on those two things. You know, anybody wants to come at it. I mean, I, I can still go throw 315 on the bar. I had to show my golfers the other day. They weren't set up for the reps. Oh, yeah. Right. But um, you know, at the end of the day, right? Like I was always an average athlete that just loved to learn, you know? And so it's, I've hopped in the pool, right? With, uh, our swim coaches and had them coach me up in swimming. They're like, Hey, float to the top. I'm like, I don't think my big butt floats to the top. <laughs> Watching the language, Samson, I got you. Um, <laughs> you know, and then it's like the same thing too. I've been out on the range with Webb and he's yelling at me because the ball's going right. And I'm like, dude, like I'm trying, like, you can stop yelling. You know, I'm, I'm not one of your players. Like, don't yell at me again, actually. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's a fun thing, too, man. I would, I would challenge coaches to get out there. And, man, sport coaches, they inherently love coaching their sports. So put yourself in those positions, right? Like, when I worked with women's basketball at Winthrop, when I was in my peak, I was the sixth – I'd be the sixth woman off the bench at a mid-major. That's how good I was playing pickup, right? Uh, <laughs> anybody from compliance is listening. It was all – we just happened to run each, into each other open gym, Okay. Yep, just um, managers. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I mean, like, that's the fun part about it, right? Like, you, you, how cool of a job we have that we get to go learn all these skills and develop a repertoire of so many different things. You know, like I, I love tennis, right? And so it's like you get to, if I go hit with, you know, the tennis team, I can have a little bit of fun, and then they can smoke me. But every now and then, you'll have a good shot, right? And so I think these are the things that you can't look past on, right? And so I think that. I mean, that's why I love watching you and all the fun you're having with basketball because, I mean, you know, you, you, you've got that low-key, 
you know, Charles Barkley type vibe to you. Um, <laughs> good rebounder, right? But man, at big, the end big of, rebound and pass guy. I mean, yeah. but like at the end of the day, right? Put it into perspective. How much fun is it to get out there and just, you know, your athletes can see you just, they, they don't need to see you. Like nobody's expecting us to be Kevin Durant or Steph Curry or Tom Brady, right? Like that's not the expectation. The expectation is you're going to help them be at their best, but they want to know that you're vulnerable yourself, right? You can't say, hey, you need to be mm. vulnerable. And then every time someone corrects you or you're afraid of what someone's going to say about you, not have any vulnerabilities yourself. And so um, that's another, like I said, I love just what you're doing with this podcast. And I just want these young coaches to take a deep breath and know that it's okay. You don't have to walk around looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger running like Usain Bolt and swimming like Michael Phelps to make it in the performance field. Absolutely. And I think that's why you and I bonded so quickly is because, you know, we talk, we, we always joke about it, you know, average looks, average athleticism, uh, above average work ethic to, to make up for those two things. Okay. So I'm going <laughs> to clarify, I, I have great looks, average <laughs> athleticism. Yeah. All right. So the looks, maybe that's how you feel, man, but you see this hair. Uh, uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, my fault. My fault. Maybe, no, I mean, maybe that's me projecting. Yeah. I mean, we all, we all can't be big Dan, you know, I love the guy to death. Exactly. You know, and so, for context, you know, when Dan came, he came on this podcast, the director here at the University of Tennessee, he's uh, 57 years old and looks like he's still G.I. Joe. And uh, every every now and then I like call him on his humble brags, you know, so just because he <laughs> looks at you like when you can't do something. He'll, he'll stare at you and just do the peck dance, yep. you know, yeah. and you're like, all right, relax, yeah. man, come on. <laughs> so, there's hope for everybody else out there. There's hope. Absolutely. You just got to grind through it, yeah. you know, but w one thing I really loved about your philosophy is, is when you talk about, okay, the first couple of years was getting the program set. And then now you have the culture where all the freshmen come in, they immediately know the uh, tone, all the transfers come in. So they say, Hey, it's either get left. What is it? Get right or get left. So uh, you have this perfect system in place. What I think that you do to take it to an extra level is you think more about, okay, what are some other areas I can help out in? Because this is already running efficiently enough. This is already a really good program. Instead of trying to tweak something over and over again, like trying to change your program or find kind of loose points or kind of go the easy route and say, hey, I got a program set. I don't really have to coach that hard. A lot of these people can come in. You've taken the mentality of, okay, what are some other areas? Like you're talking about communication uh, and developing the culture of the team. And, and I think that's what truly attests to developing programs and, and making these athletes better because you're not focusing on just the strength side. Once you figured out the strength side is mostly taken care of, you know, obviously you still have to coach, but a lot of it is now more about finding those extra areas and those extra things that you can do to help out the team. And that's one of the reasons I really want to bring you on is because you have a system uh, of the ships and I really, really wanted to talk about this and I wanted everybody to kind of hear about this. So can you take us through your ships um, and kind of break it all down for us? Yeah, let's talk about it. So I'll talk about the evolution. So it's all about giving a ship S H I P. Right. So, Oh yeah. Um, you know, I, there used to be a time I'd meet with recruits and you're always looking for sayings. And, you know, I remember thinking, Hey, it's all about relationships and championships. And it started out with those two ships. Right. And it's hard to kind of disagree. Like, what are you going to say? No, I don't like relationships and I don't like championships. Right. So it was a really easy saying for recruits to get down with, you know, I'm sitting there and over time, as you go throughout your career, it's like, you need to have a philosophy. And for me, it's like, well, what are you good at? Like, what do you do better than everybody else, right? Like, what are you gonna hang your hat on? And I was like, man, I grew up, I lived in five schools in five years at one point, all these different states. I've been all around the country. I'm like, man, I, you know, I'm good at building relationships. You know, I, I love getting to know people. I genuinely care about them. I'm gonna help them if I can, right? So it's like, that's that's who I am. So let's, let's think about it. So I'm like, what would the stages be? I'm like, well, you gotta build a relationship first, you know? So every year, you know, I meet with my athletes and it's like, how are you gonna help the team? But the first question I ask him, and this is important for young strength coaches to hear, is what are the three things you expect from me, right? You start a relationship off, what are the expectations? Like when you get married, when you and Tess get married, there's going to be some expectations, right? That you're going to love her till death do you part. Um, obviously, you know, that your money's probably going to be shared. I don't know, maybe she signed a prenup. I, I know you got your, you know, we all know that Coach Connor out here has got millions, so maybe that guy. Just a guy, um, just a guy. <laughs> but no, in all, you know, in all seriousness, right? Like there's expectations on what that vow means, right? And it's pretty serious, right? Oftentimes we expect these athletes to trust us, which is the key of our relationship without asking for any expectation. Now, when I do it, you know, it, I, you people would be shocked. One of the number one things athletes request is play bangers, 
the music, right? So I know that that's important to their experience in the performance world, right? So all you people that don't want to play music, that's cool. I'm not going to say that you shouldn't, but I'm just going to say next time, maybe ask if that was your athlete's expectation, don't be upset if they're not digging it, right? Uh, but then it's, hey, that you teach me or that you make me better, right? So that that already lets them know that, hey, I'm here to help you and I want to know how I can do that, right? Um, and then from that, as you start to talk about programming in the weight room, right? Like we can talk about an Olympic lift. I, you remember, you've seen my program. I have Olympic lift swim. Everybody's like, what is this? It's like, dude, it may be a clean. It may be a power clean. It may be a snatch. It might be a high pull. And it's like, it might be a jump shrug. It's like, really, it's just triple extension, but it sounds sexier to say Olympic lift, right? Um, <laughs> and I get it, right? They may not get triple. It may be double extension with the, you know, whatever. All you people out there want to come at me. I love it. Fill me up uh, with some DMs. But uh, in all seriousness, right? Like, I want to know what they're good at and how I can help them escalate that, right? If I got a kid that comes in, they're an elite, you know, Olympic lifter. They've been living in Slovenia, which I coached a couple of, you know, Olympic athletes from Slovenia, right? Uh, I'm not going to hold them back as I coach this other kid who has never touched a barbell before and is sneezing before they like, they're like allergic to it. You know, it's like giving them allergies. Right. So I, I want to make sure that I don't hold one back while I help the other get better. Right. So now what I'm doing is we have a relationship with each athlete. I'm creating some ownership because they're getting a little bit of say in their program, right? They're getting a chance to determine, you know, I always like to ask athletes, what do you think? You know, and that ownership piece, goes a long way, right? Think about it. When your parents gave you the keys to the car and you got to drive it and you didn't have to text them where you were going next, you felt, man, you know what? They got me. You know, they believe in me, right? So that belief is important. So that's ownership. The hard part about ownership is the athletes realize that's hard. So that's hardship. Man, when you own something now, it's like, hey, if it didn't go the way we thought it would at the end of the year, yeah, you can blame me a little bit, but you, you know, I'm gonna hold the mirror up for you a little bit too, right? Because mm-hmm. you had some say in this, right? And it then allows us to have that conversation of what are you doing with the other 22 hours you're outside the facility, right? I'm building this program on the assumption that you're getting seven, eight hours of sleep. I get it six to seven hours some nights. I'm building on the assumption you're not drinking your face off, right? You're not four loco in it up at the cookout, right? Like I'm building this program based on that. And if you're doing that, like, hey, that's cool, but now you're not owning it, right? So don't be frustrated when it doesn't go the way you thought it went. And man, I mean, who, what? nobody comes in and just owns it right away, right? That's the beauty. That's why we all have coaches. That's why we all have mentors. We have people that are willing to have those hard conversations with them. That's where hardship comes from. And when athletes start to grasp that, now you can talk leadership. And it's funny, I think everybody talks about leadership in a different way. Well, it's because there's all different types of leaders, right? And so it's just allowing that athlete to create a pathway to where they can be a leader and give back. One of the things I've done a better job of these last couple of years is with kids that aren't vocal, I'm not trying to make them vocal anymore. I'm learning like, hey, look, that's who they are. And they almost free up the second you let them know, look, you don't need to be that, but I need you to be this, but be this at a very high level, right? Um, And then once you've got leaders in place, now you can start talking championships, right? And at the end of the day, that's what we're all doing. And, and what I mean by championship, and it's not just within the weight room, right? This is within businesses, the military, different places that I'll go and speak is what is your end mission, right? Like what was the mission and did we accomplish it? And that's the thing that we have to make sure that if it's okay to not accomplish it, right? But how do we get better the next time we go at it? And I think that that's the thing that, um, you know, we live in a society, it's like, yeah, you know, seconds, the first loser and all that, blah, 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 blah. Right. But at the end of the day, too, it's our job to audit where did we improve and where can we improve? And it's OK to admit it. Right. And then you just kind of start that whole cycle back over. And what I would tell coaches, strength coaches, listen, when you deal with sport coaches or administrators or different, whether it be athletic training, nutrition, et cetera, do the same thing. Right. Build that relationship. Right. I've worked with, you know, whether it be a dietitian. Some dietitians have different things that they value. So let them kind of run that, right? Take that off your plate. And then now they get some ownership. But with that ownership becomes some hardship, right? Like we hired uh, Dr. Smith. He's our director of applied performance science here. And uh, he's doing some things. I'm like, hey, look, man, you want to do this? Like you're going to own it, right? And you're going to get to do it, right? And I'm not going to be the one explaining whether or not it works. And that's cool, dude. Like, hey, I love that you're getting more of a say, but that's also hard. So just remember every time you you got that idea. How am I going to deal with that? Right. And then lead it through it. And I'm at a point in my career where the ego is not there. So I love seeing people lead through things, right? Like he's doing a great job. And so I think that that's something that we need to discuss more and more about 
in our profession is, is are we really building the relationships we need to build, right? Like I'm not a big fan of complaining about whether it be a sport coach or an athlete, right? Like I've got a thing up on my whiteboard that's like, you know, effective people are not problem minded. They're opportunity minded. They feed opportunities and solve problems, right? Like, um, dude, feed opportunity, right? Like look for places that you can go build that bridge so that you don't end up where you thought you should be. And that doesn't mean that I don't have issues, right? Like it's not all John Gordon. Shout out, John. I love you. Um, but it's not all energy. Just came to our school. Yeah. I love John, man. Great dude. Yep. Um, it's funny, but it's not always going to be energy bust, right? Like I get that. And I live in a reality where there's going to be times where those hard conversations are going to have to happen. And I now get excited <laughs> when they do, or if someone has them, because it means that person's trying to help you long-term. Right. And so I think that that's important that you build that trust. And I'll leave you with this thought when it comes to trust and that's important within the relationship. Think about it like this. I love Chipotle, right? Um, Chipotle came to me tomorrow and offered me Chipotle for life. I would sign the deal, but I don't trust them worth anything, right? People get sick. I've seen that what their, what their salmonella will do, you know, like I've seen the news. I keep eating Chipotle. It's never going to deter me. Right. Um, but I know there's a little risk. So I love them, but I don't trust them. Right. I trust my wife. Right. So there's a difference. And so mm -hmm. as you build those relationships, just know that it's not about, your athlete loving the weight room or loving that set of squats. That's about them trusting the process because of the relationship they have that you're making them better when they trust. And here's the, the cool part. And I've seen this now um, with my programs, man, when your upperclassmen trust and your best players trust, everybody else kind of has to fall in line. Right. And that's the, the secret to it all is, man, I don't go to bed at night worried about those things. And since I don't, man, I'm, I'm more able to enjoy all the other aspects that there are in life because I'm not like, man, like, are they going to, are they going to do what I'm going to ask them to do? No, I mean, they, they trust it. Right. And, and part of this results driven, but you have to free yourself up to allow that to happen. And if you're trying to control everything, man, like that's, that's how you end up burnout. Right. And I don't really like that term because it hurts me that that's where people end up, but you end up there because you're almost trying to make it about you and not them, so to speak. And so I leave it with all that. That's what give a shit looks like. Uh, shout out to building relationships, right? They, I've never seen anybody say, you know, I've got too many good relationships and I've won too many championships. Boom. Mm. There you go. Boom. Right there. You know, and, and I, I love that you say it's not always energy bus because I, I would disagree with with Greg Adamson. It's always energy bus every single day. <laughs> uh, we you know, but I think that's such a fantastic system that you have set up. I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong. We're going from relationship to hardship to ownership. Ownership, uh, then ownership, then hardship. I love it. Ownership, yeah. then hardship. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then we, you left all championships at the end. Well, I mean, that, that just comes, you know, <laughs> um, natural part of the process. Yeah. And I, and I would say this, I mean, with the ownership piece, I used to ask athletes, is it harder to rent or own, rent a, rent a condo or apartment or own a house? And I had to change my thought on this because they all said it's better to rent because you get a deposit back. And then I realized <laughs> that America is in financial trouble because this generation doesn't understand that it's actually better to own because you're paying yourself and not somebody else. But yep. you know what? I'm gonna leave that out to the finance professors out there. You guys go get it done. Um, to the people renting to these apart to these athletes, good job, man. You got them convinced that that deposit bag is better than owning the house. So crushing it. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to the slum lords, I guess. Right. Um, but. Oh, well, so, you know, one thing that I am curious about is you have set up this system and, and with Coach Kredich and I mean, almost all the coaches you've worked with, it's been a really successful program. You know, I, I, to be honest, I've been on the side more where it's okay, every year we're the underdogs, we're hungry for this. What is it like being on the side of coming back and, and being on top and still keeping that motivation to go back and win every single year? Man, dude, I, you know, I'm, I'm asking myself that too, right? We've yet to have gone back to back. And uh, that is tough, right? It's, it's tough to do it in the SEC and some teams do it and they do it better than others, right? I think that that's the difficulty is, is um, you know, me and you, we kind of resonate with the underdog. That's who we were um, as athletes and as humans, um, as students of the game. And so I think that 
when I was at Central Michigan, I loved it, man. Those are some of my favorite moments of coaching, man. We beat Michigan State at Michigan State, and it was awesome, right? My, my women's soccer team won to this day their only NCAA game, right? Made it out of the first round. When I was at Winthrop, my men's soccer team won their only ever NCAA game, made it out of the first round. Women's basketball, only NCAA tournament, you know? So, so I mean, like, I've been around those programs where those were the first, and I'm all about first, right? Because that's, that's when you know if you're a good coach or not, right? Um, we went, we, but we won our first championship here. We didn't win the, we didn't win it the next year. We won it the next year. And then we, so we've yet to have gone back to back. We won two of the last four. Right. Um, uh, I think that that's the challenge of in today's world is how do you keep the athletes excited about it? But then how do you keep the athletes together? Right. How do you build a culture that people don't want to leave? Um, uh, and then it's such a wild world, man, with the way the transfer thing works now, I think we're all still learning you know, that somebody can just end up at another SEC school, right? Um, mm. So, you know, I'll, I'll let you know, uh, you know, I don't want to give you an answer because I don't really, you know, I, I think that it's how do you get these kids to kind of believe that, I mean, you, you want to tell them, hey, it's you versus you, right? And we all tell ourselves that. But then, you know, you know, you're looking at the scoreboard just as much as they are. Let's be real, right? Like, like it's you versus you, but the score counts, you know, like. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, so I think that that's the challenge of is one thing I can remind these kids of sometimes and I will is having been at those other schools. And I think it's important that you have a pathway that you're never just in one spot. Having been on the other side, I remember when Winthrop softball beat Tennessee softball, you know, and it was like it was like that coach's 500th win. Right. <laughs> it's like, man, it was their Super Bowl. Right. And uh, it's like trying to explain to these athletes, this is that school's, they got this thing circled. You know, they can't mm -hmm. wait to show out. Like if your women's basketball team, App State walks into Summit Court, Pat Summit's a legend, we all know it. Man, they got that thing circled, right? And so it's like, how do you handle that while also still getting better, right? And handling mm -hmm. expectations. And I will say this, our men's golf team, we just had our first golf tournament and we hosted our first home tournament since 2005, right? And we're supposed to win this thing you know, we're 10th in the country. We've got four or five top 25 teams, great field, um, but we're supposed to win it. Our best golfer uh, got sick. He just came back from Scotland, played on the Walker Cup. Him and a bunch of the Walker Cup guys got sick traveling back. So he's out of the tournament and you can't sub in in the season. So we're playing with four the last two days. And uh, we won by one stroke, beat Ole Miss by a stroke and they made a run on us. And it's funny, it's, you know, the guys where, first off, I know our culture's where it needs to be because we won and they were not necessarily happy. Right. Like they were hungry for more. They want to get right back to practice. Uh, but more importantly, all those guys, all four guys are from Tennessee getting to play at home. Right. Two of those guys are seniors. And so it's pretty cool to watch that happen. But man, it, the pressure they felt on that back nine is another team got hot. It's tough to describe, you know, and so it's it's tough being the hunted. You know, everybody else is playing looser. You know, you're supposed to win. You're at home. You've played the course. You know, so I think that that's a. You just have to be that much better, right? That's the message is, you know, so I think for me, it's like, how do you get better? Like, look, dude, you're elite. You don't get to Tennessee unless you're an elite athlete. It don't matter the sport, right? But how do you get 2% better here? How do you get 2% better there? Where do you improve? And I, I think that that's the, the challenge is, is getting athletes to buy into that part of it. Um, but yeah, man, it's, uh, it's obviously – a different feel, especially, you know, we were sixth in the Learfield Cup this past year, which is the highest we've ever been in the history of the department. And uh, we won the SEC, all SEC Cup for the second year. So we went back to back and it's the first time we won that. So, man, like the hard part with Tennessee right now is big thanks to Kelsey Ballerini, Morgan Wallen, Peyton Manning. I mean, it's a hot school, man. Like it's oh, a yeah. hot place to be. Enrollment's at a record, you know, a record enrollment you know so it's not just athletics it's just a it's knoxville's popping right and so i think that is the thing that we need to be very cognizant of and be reminding our athletes of this is not to be taken for granted right this opportunity mm -hmm. this time together um you know and so it's it's a it's a challenge man i wish i could show them the taj mahal weight room wise and then take them to alcatraz <laughs> right like i always tell people you know so i had to swim i built what's called the lot it's a bunch of racks and some turf man i just hammered the kids on monday nights out there you know, like, and it, I think it's helped us keep that grit because, oh, yeah. man, you lose it a little bit. You walk in our weight room, you know, you were here and you've been here. I mean, it's it's nice, dude. It's elite, right? Like, our facilities are second to none. And they're only getting better. Like, that's what's crazy. I'm building a, a $3 million golf weight room, 
and be done yep. by the end of the semester just for golf right like it's wild you know so it's like how do i keep those guys locked in and kind of keep them street hungry so to speak you know make sure that they're not eating and their bellies aren't full uh despite the fact that you know they've got like an infrared sauna a cold plunge three garage doors <laughs> that open up to a proteus motion yep i got some kaisers all these racks i got all this and it's like man you know, it's like, dude, you need to earn this, right? So I think that uh, that's the challenge is like, it's unbelievable what they have, but it's also making sure that they don't for a second lose perspective. And I think, yeah. I know, I think you do a great job of it. I, you know what, I'm going to bring up an example actually myself is uh, working with golf. I can't remember the name of the gate. What gate was it? Oh, G10, the... G10. G10, yeah. G10. Oh my Off goodness. Off season. Off season. That's, that's something where, you know, I'll tell you what, if that's like one of those moments where it's like, do I really want to be a strength coach? Because I'm running hill sprints with the golfers and like, I'm I, like, I'm waiting for somebody to throw up so I can get a break. <laughs> and it was, it was brutal. But I mean, like you said, it's I, I, my experience going to Tennessee, that was, you know, I was at UPenn beforehand, but then I was with the New York Jets and then University of Tennessee. So, you know, I, I'm really used to really, really nice weight room. So I myself even took it for granted just becoming an intern because I was like, yeah, like I'm always going to work in the best. And the football weight room is fantastic. Like both of them are probably my top two favorite weight rooms of all time. And so it, those those moments and in, in working and in, first of all, learning to take it to different locations, to switch it up, keep it interesting for the athletes. But now here in your perspective, even later on and understand, Hey, it's also to make sure that these guys stay hungry. And it's also understand that there's still a grind aspect of things. You can't get comfortable in the moment. I mean, it, it, you know, it's blowing my mind a little bit right now, just hearing that. Yeah. And I'll leave, you know, G10 is a, uh, it's a ramp at the football stadium for those listening. Morgan Wallen wrote a song about it. Uh, shout out Morgan, like we're friends, but, uh, uh <laughs> no, it's, uh, we go out there in the off season and, you know, we run Hills, right. And we play golf with it now, dude, I've gotten really cool with it. It's, uh, we do the circuit and then we play golf and, this is a par three. We run this far, par four, par five. That's we work awesome. our way all That's the way awesome. up. Loser adds a score. He can birdie eagle. I put him in teams. Loser has an extra couple runs on the par five. We play nine hills or nine holes on the front. If I don't like how it went, we'll play 18. Um, I'm, I'm glad and, I did my time earlier. And then, I'll, <laughs> and then I'll tell you this. It's pretty cool. Now that we sell alcohol at Neyland Stadium, all the beer coolers are right at the top of G10 locked up. Oh yeah. So they got to run up there. I think it might've been like that when you were here and they're, they're looking at it. And they it was, just, it was yeah. the first year. It was, I, I remember it. It, be, it was a bunch of Trulies and it was a bunch of like Bud Lights. And I was just staring at them up at the top and it was, it was dark. And the only thing you could see was the illuminated uh, refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> As guys are puking over the side. Right. So I think, yeah, man, that's the perspective, right? I think that that's the, that's the challenge, right. That we all have to, make sure we remember, you know, and you can't be frustrated, right? If you don't give them an opportunity to be that dog or be a savage or get after it, don't ask them to do that. Right. And so, uh, you know, you got to have the wherewithal about that. And, you know, like I said, for swim, I've got the lot and for golf, I've got G10. So all the strength coaches out there listening, you got to have a spot. You can take your kids. When I worked with women's soccer here, it was Lakeshore Park, man. We ran hills, you know, and we ran hills. We've, yeah, we've got Howard's knob here. You know, oh that, yeah! When you pull in that massive mountain that you, because Greg's a little familiar with App State, he told yeah. me a funny story. Came up here one time and got what was it? A brown recluse? Yeah, I got bit by a spider in Blue, <laughs> North Carolina. Man, I got sick on my way home. So, Greg was like, loved it up there. Got bit by a spider. Was sick for weeks. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, hey, Greg, thank you so much for your time. I mean, really, it's, it was awesome for me to one catch up with you and then, and then two, but I mean, we worked what five years ago now, almost four, four or five years ago and to hear your perspective on things. Now, as I've coached a little bit more, it's been really interesting to just kind of pick up, pick the pieces apart a little bit more and understand your reasoning behind things besides just making it hard. You know, um, it, it, it's helped me a ton. So, um, Hey, I'll, I'll leave you the floor. Is there any message you want to get across to any strength coaches that are listening now? Yeah. I mean, all the strength coaches out there listening, follow this guy, man. Uh, coach Connor, <laughs> you. you know, he's, uh, he truly cares about the profession. He cares about where it's headed. He's doing a lot with this podcast. He's somebody I would get in touch with. Um, he has just a huge heart to help anybody out there. So I would leave him with that. The other thing is, man, just keep pushing, right? You're going to have some jobs. You're going to have some days. You're going to have some years. It may not necessarily go the way you want it, but, you know, don't let up and don't let somebody tell you like, hey, that this profession isn't what it should be. Ask yourself how you can go fix it, right? How can I give back? Where can I go improve it? And just kind of when you start to look at those things, you're going to have a little bit of a different perspective. And Connor, I really appreciate you having me on. Um, I've kind of limited my podcasting the last couple of years. I've just been, 
I've been so busy and, you know, I, but I, I can't not tell you yes. Cause you're so beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, um, but no, man, I appreciate all you're doing. I absolutely love watching. I'm cheering for you unless, it, you know, unless you're playing the balls, um, obviously <laughs> uh, shout out to the paychecks. And so to all the listeners, last but not least, let me know how the shout outs went, man. I'm trying to get younger with my terminology. So no, it's fantastic. Yeah. My, my, yeah. my guys said, shout, guys out, great. Out. shout out, you know, so shout out, yeah. <laughs> shout out to everyone. So. Well, thank you, Greg, for the kind words. And seriously, thank you for coming on. I've, I've really enjoyed having you on. Last thing, uh, social media, where can our listeners find you? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram, UT Coach Greg. Twitter, if you're still doing that. If you're younger, you probably don't know what that is, but UT Coach Greg. Um, you can email me, greg.adamson at utk.edu or call me, 803-389-0068. Um, that's all my contact info, man. Just reach out. I don't have TikTok. I do and I don't like I deleted it. But anytime someone like does something, like if you click it, it like brings your account back. So I have to like then go redelete it, you know, but I, I got to be careful, man. I'm also in the military. That's why, that's why I'm on TikTok's good side, man, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got a lot of info on yeah, people. Yeah, like. man. TikTok, man. I can't I got to be careful with that. My military side of me, they don't. Yeah, we don't mess oh, that's with, right. We don't mess with that TikTok, it's- buddy. Oh, it's good. It's good. I made it out of Texas because I think Texas Tech. You can't put. You can't do it on the Wi-Fi anymore. So yeah, that's what's up. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Greg. Seriously, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed it. Hey, I gotta leave you with this. What are you doing? Right. What are you doing? Uh, November, I think is sixteenth, man. You November sixteenth. If we don't have a game, I, I'm wherever you need me to be. Lil Wayne coming to Knoxville. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> well, I'm definitely where you. Well, I'll definitely be there. All right, I'm writing it down in the notes right now. There it is, baby. Anybody Any else? Listeners, come yeah. come meet us out there too. Lil Wayne we'll out in, in Knoxville, on, uh, G10. the fireman. Let's go. <laughs> Here we go. All right, I'll see, see you, buddy. Greg.